Hi there, AWAC here. Um, thank you all very much for visiting. It's been a very long time uh, since my last video. Um, and uh, the inspiration for this one uh, came around uh, April earlier of this year, as of this recording. Um, and I suppose the best way to explain it is, is sort of quasi -chron chronologically. Um, way back in the 1980s, I uh, used to do a lot of work on the Amiga computer. And one of the earliest 3D rendering programs ever made available for personal computers was called Videoscape 3D. Uh, it was written by Alan Hastings, and um, I did a lot of work with it at the time. And so back in April, uh, I found myself thinking, self, I'd like to see some of my old work again. Um, and there is a, a piece of free software available that does 3D modeling and rendering called Blender 3D. And once upon a time, it used to be able to load uh, Videoscape 3D files, but somewhere along the line, it lost that ability. Not sure what happened there. Uh, so I decided to write a plugin to load and display Videoscape object files. Uh, and so I sat down and bashed away for a few hours and I got it working. It was, I was looking at old uh, geometry and uh, that I'd done uh, way back in the day. And then, Something happened. Uh, I think I know what it is now. Uh, but I, as I was playing around with it, Blender seg faulted. And I hadn't saved the file. And when I went to use the uh, when I went to use the uh, recover previous work option, it didn't come back. You think after forty years with fiddling around with these machines, I'd know to save my work. Nope, nope. I still make that mistake. So I thought it would make tremendously gripping television to recreate that plugin uh, live on camera. Now, full disclosure, uh, this will be the third time that I have tried to make this video. I, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't terribly satisfied with the previous attempts. Um, also, uh, those of you, uh, Blender's uh, plugin language is Python. And for those of you who are Python experts out there, may find this video somewhat uh, frustrating because Python is not my first language. I'm mostly a C guy or with a little bit of Golang here and there. Uh, and so this is not really going to be idiomatic Python. This is going to be idiot Python. So with that said, oh, you know, that was a little extravagant. Uh, let, me, let me change that. To this. I'm not going to subject it to the whole desktop. Just uh, go to there. So let's launch Blender. Uh, and there it is. Actually, let me uh, let's turn that off and do a little bit of magic here to shrink it down. Uh, so as I said, this is Blender 2.90, which is the latest version as of this recording. Uh, and the way you start to write a plugin is you go to the scripting tab and you go to templates. Python, and where is it? File import. And what it does is it creates a bunch of boilerplate for you uh, to load files, file data into Blender. And so this is where I started from. Is uh, I started started from this, and I started uh, hacking up on on all of that. Uh, now, as it happens, uh, I'm not especially fun. Let me let me blow that up for you. There we go. Um, I'm not especially happy with this as a development environment. So what we're going to do is we're going to save this off into where to go in there in there. And we're going to call it import port the other L R. There we are. V S 3 D dot pi yes save that out and then we're going to go over to this text editor which we prepared earlier in an oven at 350 degrees uh, and then open that there it is okay and actually there we go uh, okay so this is so this is the boilerplate for loading stuff into uh, Blender. Uh, so this is the function that actually reads the data, um, and then and and the rest of this is boilerplate just to run the UI and and, and all the hooks for 
for getting into Blender. Uh, I was going to set up something over here uh, again in an oven at 350 degrees. So let me turn off some annoying things. Yeah, default star dot texts, so we're not going to be using that. And yeah, there's a there's another one in here that uh, that drives me crazy. I'll figure it out later. So so what we want to do? Okay, so what is it we're doing? What was what we're doing is we're loading um, VideoScape 3D objects. So you should probably see what those look like. <clears throat> so let me see if I can find one here. No. Uh, let's see. Okay. And... Jump cut. Okay. I uh, found it. Uh, let's see. Objects. And then we're, what we're going to do. Yes. I... Jeez. There we go. And then in here is. There it is. Okay. I happen to know this. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, let's open up. There we go. <sighs> All right. So what are we looking at? Actually, can we make this bigger? Just a second. Um, let's make that. There we go. It, whoops. There we go. All right. All right. What are we looking at? So this is a Videoscape 3D geometry file. Uh, it is a collection of vertices and polygons. Um, the polygons in Videoscape 3D are n-gons, where n can be as little as one. Uh, they're not. They're not strictly triangles. Um, and uh, yeah. So so the first line uh, we see here is 3DG1. My assistant is uh, mucking around in the background here. I don't know if you can see her. Let's just go like this. Say hi, Lily. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the first line is uh, 3DG1, uh, and that's basically a file version identifier. Uh, the next line is the number of vertices in the file, followed by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that number of vertices. Uh, each line is a single vertex. Uh, a vertex is composed of three floating point numbers in X, Y, Z order. Um, and then after that is a list of polygons. Uh, each line is a single polygon. The first number in the uh, on the line is the number of vertices in that polygon, followed by indices into uh, the vertex list. So this would be offset one, this would be offset zero, this would be offset four, this would be offset five. Uh, so one, zero, four, five. So that which constitutes whoops, constitutes the four vertices in this polygon. And then this last number is a, a color code. Uh, what color is this polygon? Um, and that is uh, uh, that we're not going to talk about that right now. And the number of polygons in the object is you basically read polygons until you get to the end of the file. And we hit the end of the file, that's it, and the object is done. So if we're going to read this, we need to open the file. And so we're given the file, yeah, we're given the file name. Um, all right, we don't need that. And we're going to need a place to store the vertices and the, let's see. So, let, yeah, let, let's see. I can type. <laughs> there we go. All right. So, and I'm going to use a little idiom that I learned about. Uh, let's see, so that I don't have to keep looking for EOF while I'm reading lines. So I'm going to say, uh, how did it go? With, I 
think actually, yeah. Drop that here. Take that out. Um, and I don't want it to do anything fancy with what it's reading, so we're going to pretend it's binary with no encoding. Uh, let's see, as file f. Okay. Right. And what that buys us is that this will just read stuff until we hit end of file and then magically exit. Um, okay, so the file is now open. So now we need to read the first line. So the header, header equals f dot read four bytes. Um, I'm going to explain. So I'm reading just the first four characters. I am not reading the new line at the end. Uh, that will become clear later uh, when I do a little surprise. Uh, let's see. Okay, and then we have to check if it's the header we want. So if header dot lower um, oh, yeah, equals three dg one. Okay, so I don't actually know if it's case insensitive on the uh, on the file header, but I'm not going to take the chance. So we're just going to make that. Uh, convert it to lowercase and see if it's 3dg1. And then if it is, uh, we then eat the rest of the line. I am, s I have this impulse to add a semicolon after all the, after all these statements, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so that's process the header. Now we need to read the number of vertices. So, so f dot read line. And we want to turn that into an integer. Okay, and, and we'll call that inverts. All right. And then we read that number of lines. So for i in range inverts. Uh, and then and then we will read the vert so it's f dot read line to read a so at this point we are reading these yeah we're reading that and then all right so vertex string oops rolls f dot read line uh, <clears throat> and then we need to parse it out. And you do that using a th thing called split. Basically, so you can say vster dot split will basically return a list of each of these strings that are separated. So basically, it looks for white. It's separates the string according to white space and then builds a list of each of these pieces uh, separated by white space. So, and what was that idiom? I think it's called, I think they called it a list comprehension, but it was kind of, it's like, sorry, I'm thinking out loud. Um, so you do like, for v in vster split, which iterates over it, and then you cast it to a float, and then put that inside a list, and then you read that off as a tuple. Or you just read it off as multiple arguments. So it's x, y, z. I think that's right. I think that's how I remember it. 
And then once we have that vertex, we just append it to the list of vertex. So we say verts.append. And it wants vertex, vertices as a tuple, not as a list. So we use paren x, y, z. OK. And OK, so let's see how let's see how well this works so far. Um, right, so we're reading that. So we're just going to yeah, so we're just going to bomb out right there. Let's see, I want I want to print these out. So I think we say I think we just say print like that. Let's get rid of that. I think we'll, we'll see what happens. All right, so let's save that out. So now we go back over to Blender, which yeah is over here, and here's this lovely convenient little thing that says. Uh, if, it, if it, it wants you to reload it. It says reload from disk. There we go. So so we can pull our work in right away. Uh, and then we run it. <laughs> now I have to remember how to do that. Is that it? Oh, so it is. All right. Uh, let's see. So now I'm going to navigate over to the magic place. Uh, let's see. Oh. Hang on. Doop. Doop. Archive. Volumes. Um, there we go. And then we're gonna we're gonna so we're gonna load that thing which was why aren't you showing me? I know there's files in here. Oh, is the is the filter on? Yeah, turn the filter off. Jeez. That's what I need to turn off. Okay, so it's called Chrome Tilt. So let's see what it does. Alright, so we're not gonna see anything here because we're not done. However, we launched this from a shell. Aha! 866-212-312214. Let's see, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight, six, six, two, one, two, three, one, two, two, four, seven. Eight, six, six, two, one, two, three, two, one, two, two, four, seven. Okay, so it looks like it parsed those. Wow, we've got our vertices. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> stage two. All right, so now we, uh, so now we just read read lines and uh, that is done I think the idiom for that is for line in F so it just reads this will read this will read F line by line um, and where does that line oh it ends up in line so now let's see we're here. We need to split this up. How do we split this up? Well, we do it with split again. All right. So, so I guess it, this one, except it's they're not floats; they're ints. And we, it's not X Y Z. It could be. I mean, it's the, this example is uh, four vertices per polygon, but it theoretically could be anything. Uh, so we actually want to capture this as a list. So what do we call this? Uh, just vowels, I guess. Um, all right, so now we have a list of integers. The first integer is the number of vertices equals vowels of zero. And then we want, 
And the faces... Oh, I haven't created any storage for faces yet. Okay. And Blender wants the faces as lists of integers. It wants, it wants vertices as a tuple of floats, but it wants faces as, as um, lists of integers. So if we slice vowels, if we say faces.append from from vowels from one to inverts minus, minus one. And this, right, and then this will exit. So this will exit when the last line is read. Yes, from, okay, so from one, so that's, so, so out, okay, so when this is split, four is vowels of zero, vowels of one, two, three, four. Inverts minus one, or is it inverts plus one? One, two, three. It's not inclusive. No, and it's plus one. It's plus one. There we go. Uh, okay. And 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 this discards the color code at the end, so we're not using that yet. So all right. So print faces all right so let's go back over here reload it and run it again and there we go it, oh yeah chrome tilt Boop. oh what's wrong Execute, read some data, list comprehension, invalid literal for int with base 10. 8.6.866. What? Did we not exhaust? For i and range inverts, it picked them all up. Hang on a minute. So, did you print anything before that? No, you didn't. Phase 10, 0 .4, 0 0.866. Huh. I'm in F. Vowels int V. V in. Oh, wait. No, 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 no. Copy pasta. There we go. All right. That actually, while I'm here, while I'm here, just turn the filter off. Just get rid of that. It's just going to annoy me. All right. Reload. Run it. Yay. Didn't have to do that. All right. Chrome tilt. All right. Let's have a look. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's the number of faces in a cube, and we have 1045, 2301. 1045, 2301. So that looks like it's worked. Cool. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, how do I get them into Blender? Um, well, it turns out uh, I, I already researched that. Uh, let's see. Yes. Um, this is so what I so what, what I'm doing here is I am copy pasting some boilerplate uh, from this example on Stack Exchange that basically does the uh, creation of the various uh, structures, uh, data structures to uh, to to get to, to data basically exercises the various APIs in Blender to uh, get it to uh, add new data. 
So what I'm trying to figure out is whether I want that one or that one. I think I want this one because it's a little more generic. Let's see. Is that right? I don't know, let's do, let's do this one. I'll just grab all that. We've already, import BPY is already there. All right, so let's grab that. Uh, go back over here. And, alrighty. And we'll indent that over. We are not using this data. My assistant is trying to climb up the back of my chair. Did you want to visit? Did you want to visit? Or, or, did, or did you just want to be an annoyance? Come here. Yeah, she's busy. Uh, all right. So, except we're not calling it uh, my beautiful mesh. Uh, we are calling it. Actually, we're going to name this after the file it came from. So, OS dot, what was it? Path base name file. What is it? File path. All right. Okay. And then, and then that just picks that up. And then it just goes into a thing called collection. Sorry, I'm one of those guys who likes spaces before the parens. Six active, and then mesh from pi data, verts, edges, faces. We don't have any edges. The edges are implicit in the faces. We don't have a separate thing. So I think we just replace that with nothing. Um, and actually this should be one stage out because we're done loading because we've hit the end of the file. So now we're down here. All right. All right. Let's see what happens. Oop, wrong one. There we go. Oop, there, that one's more interesting. Okay. Reload from disk. Um, over here until and nope OS not defined oh I have to import it uh, do I have to import all of OS or yeah OS I think I I think I have to yeah I think I have to OS dot Path is what I have to do. All right. Do, 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 do. Yes. All right. Actually, let's get rid of this because if it works, I want to be able to see it. All right. I think. Oh! Hello there. Yes, that's how it's supposed to look. It was, um, it was turned on its side so that it the these vertices were right on the axis so it could rotate on its point hmm okay <laughs> alrighty well that's well that's very nice what how many lines of code was that geez that's nothing what else have I got what else have I got Da, 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 da. Let's see. Let's go back. Let's, and then we'll go up one level. And uh, let's see. Primary. I think this one is a text file. Yep. <laughs> Hello there. <laughs> How are you? That's actually rotated. Hang on, let me see. Let's see. Uh, rotate 
x 90 degrees there we go that's the way it's supposed to be um that they had x and y swapped the, uh, um i think there's the left-handed versus right-handed coordinates uh videoscape is the opposite of blender um yeah no that's that's the old uh, <laughs> um the reason i have this object um is because uh, well for uh, let's uh let's switch over to something a little bit more fun to watch all right we'll just switch to this um i've been a star trek uh, weenie for a fair long fairly long time and so when i got into the computer lab at uh, the community college we had graphics capable terminals and i said well i know what i'm doing with these and um i also had a copy of the franz joseph plans and sat there just measuring every dimension of the ship and uh, ended up with uh uh, a fairly decent wireframe, certainly for the 1983 time frame. Uh, so I've had this data set for almost 40 years. Um, uh, so, yeah. Wow. All right. So that, um, so, so I guess that's, uh, that's how you load a, um, uh, that's how you load a video, a videoscape, uh, Videoscape 3D object file. Well, it turns out there's more than one kind of Videoscape 3D object file. What we've just loaded is the text format. Uh, there is another format. So let's uh, let me switch back over to here and over there. Uh, it turns out that text uh, format is rather slow to parse and rather slow to load. Um, and whoops. Uh, parsing all these parsing all these uh, text numbers uh, actually is is kind of tedious so for videoscape 2.0 he uh, created a new format called which he simply called binary format uh, and basically it is exactly this format except that instead of lines of text it's uh, just basically binary numbers so for example the eight here is a 16-bit integer. Um, each of these vertices is a collection of three 32-bit floating point values. Uh, and then this, and then each polygon is expressed exactly the same way, except that each of these entries is uh, a 16-bit value. Um, unsigned, I think. Yeah, unsigned 16-bit values. Uh, so a lot of my data is in that format. Because I was because I was you know working I was working in that format, so we'd like to be able to decode that too. So, so, and that's why I only read the first four bytes of the file so that I could come down here and say, uh, what is it? Elif header equal. Um, 3d uh, 3d b1 uh, that was the header for the binary file the first four bytes and there was no new line following it but the first four bytes were 3d b1 so once we have the okay so it, oops sorry about that uh, so so it's exactly the same format so now we read so now we need to read uh, integers uh, 16 bits at a time and floats 32 bits at a time um, and there is a nifty little facility in Python that does this called struct, which will let you take apart. In fact, I believe I have that page open here. Yes. Uh, so yes, we'll be using struct.unpack to take apart, uh, these, uh, these integers as we read them in. So, so I'm going to read. Yeah, so we'll read the number of vertices. So let's see. So we'll read the first two bytes, which is the number of vertices. Read two bytes. Uh, and then we need to unpack it into an actual integer. Um, let's see. So it's, what is it? Struct.unpack format buffer. Unpack format. Oh, 
We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, and here's the source of the buffer. Uh, okay. So now the format. Okay. So here's. So here, here's the uh, here, here's the one of the tricky little things. Um, pregnant pause. <laughs> The okay, so as you may be aware, uh, actually, let's jump cut. Uh, so as you may be aware, computers store information in units called bytes. They're eight bits wide, and you can store a number from zero to two hundred and fifty-five, or from minus one hundred twenty-eight to one hundred plus one and twenty-seven. So if you need a bigger a number larger than that, you just take two bytes and you tack them together. Now you have sixteen bits to play with. Still not enough. Just keep tacking bytes, you know, onto onto each other. What order in memory do you store them? Do you store them like this or do you store them like this? Um, both approaches have been tried and the order in which you move, keep those bytes is called the endianness of the system, which end of the which end of the multi-byte word uh, comes first. A little endian system, the least significant byte appears at the first address in memory with more significant bytes appearing after that. In a big endian system, the most significant byte appears at the first byte in memory, with le lesser significant bytes appearing after that. Uh, the advantage of little endian systems is that multi-precision arithmetic is easier because the start address is always the same. Uh, the advantage of big endian systems is that the hex dumps are easier to read. Every Intel-based computer manufactured since the 1980s is, including the 8080, which actually is 1970s, vintage part is a little Indian system. However, the Amiga was based around the Motorola 68000, which is a big Indian system. The point of all that gigantic explanation is that the bytes are swapped. They're in the wrong order, so we have to switch them out. Uh, and happily, oh, uh, struct will do that when you unpack it. And let's see, where's the format? Here we go. And here we go. If you put a little, a less than sign, in the format, then you're telling it, actually, if we put a greater than sign, you said you're telling it that it's big endian and you want it to take it apart uh, and, and swap it for you. So we need a greater than sign and then we need a 16 bit value uh, unsigned, unsigned short. Yes, two bytes, unsigned short, capital H. So the format is greater than capital H. Uh, okay, and then all right, and then yeah, yeah. Let's just and actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this up here because I am going to want to do this step by step. All right. So let's reload this. All right, and then we're going to find a binary object. And which of these? Let's go over here. Okay, so this one is clearly declaring itself as binary, so we'll just do that. Um, what? Name struct is not defined. Oh, <laughs> sure. You picky little. All right. All right. Once again, dot bond. Okay. One thousand nine hundred twenty-one. Is that a? Oh, it's a list. Is it a tuple or is it a list? It looks like it's a tuple. Wait a minute. So print inverts. Oh, okay. So I need to do this. To get it into a usable form. Yeah, there we are, 1921. 
All right. Um, actually, let me get rid of this because if it works, we're going to want to see it. Okay, inverts. Okay, what's next? Okay, now we're loading it. Okay, so now we have the number of verts. We say for i in range verts, just like before. Uh -huh. And then we are reading three 32 bit numbers. So buff equals f dot read three times four bytes. 30, 32 bits uh, is four bytes wide. And then we need to unpack them. So we could say, I guess we could say, because we XYZ, or XYZ equals struct dot unpack. And again, it's big Indian. And what is the format specifier for 32 bits? Now, these are floating point numbers. Yeah. I have to start this all over again. I don't know. I'm just going to keep going. So these are these are floating. These are floating point numbers, but they are not really floating point numbers. Uh, they are actually in a format called Motorola Fast Floating Point. So they're still 32 bits wide. So what we're going to do is we're going to read these in as unsigned longs. Four bytes are actually unsigned integers. That's fair. Capital I. So there's three of those. So 3i, or we could have said iii, 3i buff. And now we need to convert them. So, the, but these are not, yeah, these are not IEEE 754 floating point numbers. Um, yeah, back in the day, uh, the IEEE 754, so okay. The Amiga did not have a floating point accelerator. It didn't have hardware uh, floating point acceleration, but that's okay because nobody did. It was, it didn't become affordable until about the mid 1990s. Um, so all the floating point had to be done in software. Now, if you want to do floating point properly, you've got to do a lot of checking and testing to make sure that you're not overflowing the ranges or that you, your, num your numbers are actually valid and, uh, and, and things, all sorts of things like that. On the other hand, if you don't care about that, then you can get away with a whole bunch of shortcuts. Uh, and Motorola Fast Floating Point represents um, basically something that did the arithmetic and not much else. And if you overflowed, well, too bad. That's your fault. Um, and so what's the format of a uh, Motorola FFP floating point number? Well, I looked that up too. And so the way it's described here, so M stands for Mantissa. I mean, let me blow that up. There we go. M stands for Mantissa and E stands for Exponent. Um, if you if you want to find out more about how how this actually works, go look it up. Um, it's not that hard. It's just kind of it's you know, it, it's not that hard. Um, and so what they're saying here, the mantissa is considered to be. Let me read this out. I'm trying to remind myself of this. The mantissa is considered to be a binary fixed point fraction, except for zero. It is always normalized. The mantissa is shifted over and the exponent adjusted so the mantissa has a one bit in its most significant position. Thus, it represents a value of less than one, but greater than or equal to one half. The sign bit is, yeah, so that's normal. Zero for positive and set for negative. And this excess 60, okay, that's this is the weird part. The exponent is in excess 64 notation, which means that two's complement values are up to adjusted upward by 64. So I guess you just take the exponent, I guess you take this and subtract 40 hex. And so astute observers will note that the top 24 bits are mantissa and the lower seven bits are exponent. So where's the sign bit? Um, it's, it's actually at 
bit seven. This is actually fibbing. This is, these are bits zero to six. Bit seven is the sign bit, and then bits eight through 31 are the mantissa. So what does that mean for you, the home viewer? Well, it means I get to write a new function. Uh, so we're gonna call this def ffp to float, and we're gonna pass in a value, which will be the integer that we read. So, all right. So the mantissa is the top 24 bits. Okay, so the mantissa is the val shifted down by eight. So basically we're taking these top 24 bits and we're shifting them down so that they are occupy bits uh, zero to 23. The exponent is the value and 0x7f which is the lower seven bits and oops hang on uh, m minus 40 adjusted upward by 64 so we're undoing that so yeah subtract 40 okay and the sign bit, okay, if, do I need, God, yeah, I don't think I, <laughs> yeah, in C you need the parens, in Python I don't think you do. Val and 0x80 does not equal zero, then it's negative. So we will negate the mantissa. And then, Turn. Uh, there's Python has an exponentiation function called pow. Two to the e, e being the exponent, times the mantissa. And remember, the mantissa represents a fraction, uh, always less than one. So, but it's 24 bits, so it's divided by one by 24. So, right. So the the most this could be is point nine 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 nine. Okay. So that's shifted down. That's the upper, that's the exponent. That's seven bits of exponent. That's the sign bit. The sign bit is set. Then we negate the mantissa so that this math works out. Cool. So at this point, I think I can say vert.append um it's got to be a tuple ffp to float x ffp to float y ffp to float z i think that's it I think that's it. Let's see what happens. All right, let's run it. Well, it didn't crash. Whoa. Whoa, are these numbers correct? <sighs> wow. They could be. They don't look insane, is what I'm saying. Um, for if this were if this were miscalculated, I would expect a lot of these numbers to be just wh incredibly wacky, um, with extremely large or extremely small. But these are actually looking um, 
like they're in the right range. So I think it took those apart correctly. So now we just have to take apart the faces. Um, Uh, so, so we, and we still have to read to end a file. Uh, we don't, we don't get a, a clue as to how many faces there are. We still have to read to end a file. So, let's see. While let's, let's call it true for the moment. Um, buff equals f, and each of these. Is a 16-bit integer, so f dot read two. Um, and this is actually where we want to check for end of file. So if I think read returns nothing if there's nothing left. So if not buff break. All right. So then we see inverts equals struct dot unpack uh, it is another big Indian short from buff and oh that's right let me take take the zeroth entry like we did up here um oh uh how do you want to do this inverts okay so all right so let's pretend this said let's let's pretend inverts is four we would then so we need to know how much data to read and how much to take apart so so the read part is easy So we say buff equals f dot read inverts times two. Actually, no, it's uh, inverts uh, inverts plus one because we've got that color code at the end. There we go. Um, and then we have to take it up. Then we have to unpack it but we have to tell unpack how many of it of how many things there are so we have to I think we have to dynamically assemble the format string so it's format equals big Indian um and then it's account uh and yeah in plus one and then it's h again because they're all shorts and then in. So then we say struct dot unpack format buff. Did we read the buffer? Yes, the buffer is loaded. So we're um, and these are the indices. For the for the polygons. So say all right and then we just append those to the faces except we don't want the last one because that's the color code and we're not using that so we're going from zero to uh, inverts Okay. I 
think that's all I need. Let's have a look. Didn't crash. Oh, hello. One four two nine one three twenty one three. It looks like it's getting it. Again, these numbers don't look crazy. Are there any? Yeah, here. We, yeah, here's here's some. Uh, two-digit indices. Do we have any? Yeah, here's some single-digit indices. And none of these are exceeding the vertex count, which was 1900 and something. The trouble is these are all tuples. They're supposed to be um, they're supposed to be lists. I think it's supposed to be a list. Well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, 921. Um, okay. Print birds, prints faces. Well, let's let it fully load it then. Hang on, let me let me let me let me uh, let's see. Rotate X ninety. There we go. <laughs> oh, very nice. Whoop. Yeah, like I said, I've had the I've had this data set for a very long time. I'm sure there are superior. Um, more accurate, uh, more obsessively detailed than this, but this one is mine. This one is mine. Um, wow. <laughs> All right. Um, nifty. So, wow, is that really it? Wow. That looks like it's it to load. Okay, so that's not strictly true. There are these color codes uh, out here that we haven't haven't done anything with. Um, there's uh so you know, videoscape was very very primitive uh let's, let's go back over here because it worked so well so when i did this the last time um video videoscape was very very primitive and so it basically had a fixed number of colors uh hard-coded colors it was, it was very much like a well i don't want to say it was a commodore 64 but you know it's like color 15 is white and color 2 is red and or you know things like that um and you could have, and and they had some, they could be flat shaded, uh, s glossy, so that so they would re they would kind of ref they would look like they were you know high they reflected with a high gloss paint or something like that, um, and so I went around and I looked for the color codes for old Videoscape 3D object files, and I I couldn't really find them. I knew that there was, the, I, I found a couple of fragments here and there, but I could not find a complete description of what the color codes were for Videoscape 3D. Some for somehow it's not online. Um, and so the, uh, the obvious next step for finishing loading some of this stuff to get the, is to get the, the colors and the surface attributes in. And, and it, you may be thinking to yourself like I was, well, I don't know what you're, hell you're going to do. You're going to have to get a hard copy of the manual, but you know, what kind of idiot's going to hold on to boxed copies of software for 30 years? This one, <laughs> I found my copy. Um, this, uh, yeah. So in here, let me see if I can open this up easily. Yes, back when, back when, <laughs> back when uh, there was actually hard copies of manuals. But back here, and if I can find a, find the page, it's it's further back than I remember. But yeah, in here is a complete description of the color codes for Videoscape. Uh, yeah, here we are. That's that's part of it. 
uh, is a description of the format for um, video uh, for the color codes for Videoscape 1.0 and also for another um, unusual feature which he called detail polygons. Um, these days you would use textures to paint on the surface. Didn't have that. Uh, so he had this little extra, um, um, I don't want to say kludge, but it, you know, it's, uh, it was, it was it was actually per, fairly clever, um, where it would draw the main polygon first, and then you could specify a number of so-called detail polygons, which would be rendered in specified order after the main polygon, uh, so that you could just, quote unquote draw over it. Um, and I think that's what made my original uh, original attempt at this crash because uh, some of the numbers that they use to specify this are weird. But anyway. Uh, Blender's way of handling color and surface attributes and that is much more complex um, and would take a heck of a lot more time uh, than we have in this video. So if you think that would be at all interesting, uh, leave a note in the comments and let me know whether it's worth it to do a part two of this video. Uh, I will be pushing what I have so far uh, to GitHub so that uh, interested people can can have a look at it. But um, this is uh, <laughs> uh, this is this has been uh, I, well. I found it fun. Uh, I hope you did too. Thank you all very kindly for visiting. You wanna you wanna fix that foot there? You wanna there you go.